All right. Hey, folks. Um, happy Thursday. I hope you all have had an incredible week. I hope it's been very eventful and fun, and, and we've all had a successful DrupalCon. Um, I am so glad to have you folks here today. Um, I appreciate all of your time. Um, we are today going to have a little conversation, and I'm mostly just going to make a case for the use of compassion and empathy in the workplace. So um, I'm just going to start by introducing myself, as most people do. Um, who am I? My name is Valerie Genzano. I am currently an account manager. Um, have recently transitioned out of my role as a software trainer. Um, but my background is actually in the arts and museums and education. So over the past three years, my life has gone a lot from this and this um, to a lot of this, um, as I'm sure <laughs> is expected when you make that kind of transition during a virtual world. So um, I started, like I said, my career in the arts, and I worked with kids, and I use all of the tools that I acquired working with children to also work with adults. Um, that might sound diminutive, but I promise it's not. Um, when I started to shift from teaching children in a museum to teaching adults software, um, I realized that adult people, when they are faced with a new concept or a problem or something that is has never crossed their path before, um, it's oftentimes received the same way that a child would receive it, um, sometimes with a little bit of hesitance and resistance and fear. Um, but when I realized that, a lot of stuff ended up clicking for me when it came to people. Um, there is no clear example of humanity than a, a child, right? And at the, at the core of us all, we are still the kids that we were when we were three and learning you know, our letters for the first time. Um, Children are not yet subscribed to a ton of the social norms and concepts, and while that can be gross and <laughs> sticky sometimes, and sometimes they cough all over you, sometimes it's really beautiful because they also don't know to not trust and believe in people in a really, in a really wonderful way. Um, they also haven't been burned or you know, shunned by other folks. Uh, quite yet in their lives, so I always in my job and in my life um, think back to the experiences that I've had with children, and I approach my conversations with adults not with the same tone that I would uh, as, as I would with a child, but um, with the same, again, level of, of compassion. Um, and so that is where I am coming from with my little conversation today. So. What we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about understanding empathy and compassion. Um, we're going to talk about compassion beyond a screen, right? Because it's been incredibly difficult, I'm sure, for all of us to find that same level of compassion for people since everything has been pretty virtual. Um, I'm going to spend a little time breaking down some fears that come with compassion that I see a lot and I talk to a lot of people about. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how to practice compassion uh, at work, with your loved ones, and um, almost more importantly than anything, with yourself. So starting out with why we should care about compassion. Uh, get to the root of it. We are all human. Uh, compassion and empathy are part of who we are at our core in, in the science, right? So a study came out from Harvard that says advances in neuroscience has shown us that the brain has neural networks that are hardwired with the ability to share the experiences of others including emotions and sensations. So this is hardwired into us. Um, the past two years have been stressful, distant, difficult, unstable. I'm not gonna sit here and talk about how horrible this has been to be in a pandemic, but we all know. And uh, because of these past couple years, I think it's important to regroup and recenter with how we talk to each other. Through times of loss and desperation, we only have ourselves and our shared humanity. We've seen it in about every apocalypse movie that there is, that at the end, what saves everyone is people in your lives. And while that is more of a nuclear situation, no pun intended, um, it applies to everyday life as well. Compassion 
overall is something we can practice. If you are sitting here today thinking, I am not innately a compassionate person, first of all, I would tend to disagree. But second of all, it is something that you can practice and get better at and put into your everyday life, which is what I do in my job and with the people around me. Um, at the end of the day, it's important to remember that everybody wants to be happy and at peace. That is our core mission as people. So if you come into a compassionate conversation with that in mind, it gets a lot easier. Here I have a quote by Viktor Frankl, who's a philosopher, that says, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, and to choose one's own way. I do keep this in mind as well when having conversations. It's pretty easy to say, you know, the only thing you can control is your attitude, and we've all heard it a million times, but um, if, if you put a different lens on it, it's really, it can drive a conversation into a different direction that ends up being very productive for all parties involved. So there's a lot of confusion when researching, because I did a lot of reading on this, obviously, to prepare, and trying to figure out how people understand empathy versus compassion is huge. Empathy and compassion are not interchangeable, but they are dependent on each other. Empathy is the ability to take perspective and adopt the emotions of another person. Um, it can manifest in two different ways. Pro-social behavior, which is what we're gonna be talking about when we're talking about compassion and compassionate action, or it can result in personal distress. We might hear this as empathy burnout or compassion fatigue. So it's important to remember that this empathy breaks down into two different ways, and you can choose sort of how to channel it through practice. Compassion is the desire to alleviate painful emotions of another person, which means that compassion grows from the pro-social behavior branch of empathy. Empathy is always there when there is compassion, but there's not always compassion if there's empathy. Um, compassion is then broken down further, cognitive, emotional, motion, motivational, and behavioral. Um, but I have a little graphic here that I made that reminds us how we should be thinking about this process. We are rooted in empathy. At, at the core of all of us, we have that empathy. We have that neurological ability to process other people's emotions and feel them, but we bloom and we grow with compassion. And that's what we have to aim for, that growth um, at the end of every co a passionate conversation uh, that we have. Compassion is not timidness. It is not sentimental love. You don't have to feel embarrassed to have compassion for other people. Um, it's not attachment. You can have compassion with a stranger that you'll meet once. You can have compassion with somebody who checks you out at the gas station. And it's not pity. You don't have to feel pity to feel compassionate. Um, it is, however, the appreciation of humanity and the willingness and want to see others successful and happy in their endeavors. At the end of the day, of the day this compassion is that shared want for happiness, not only for yourself, but for your colleagues, for your family, for you know, your clients, whoever it may be. There are some measurable benefits um, when it comes to compassion and compassionate conversation. Um, there are about a, a million studies that I'm not gonna go into about the science behind health and positive social relationships. If you're interested in the science, I do recommend looking up those studies because it's interesting, but there's data to back up the fact that your positive and compassionate social relationships with the people in your life, the people that you work with, the people that you come into contact with on the street, benefit not only your, but their physical health, longer life, um, less illness somehow. So it's really, it's global health <laughs> when we're talking about compassion. Um, you also have this quote here from the Association for Psychological Science Witnessing another person's altruistic behavior elicits elevation 
uh, which is a discrete emotion that in turn leads to tangible increases in altruism. Elevation in this study is defined as the feeling that you get when you watch something good happen for another person, like the opposite of schadenfreude, um, which is when you think it's hilarious when bad things happen to other people. Elevation is the good feeling that comes out of good things happening for other people. Um, and that leads directly to increases in altruistic behavior. Compassion and leadership creates stronger connections between people, it improves collaboration, raises levels of trust, and enhances loyalty. In addition, studies that find compassionate leaders, uh, studies find that compassionate leaders are perceived as stronger and more competent, and that's from the Harvard Business Review. So let's talk a little bit about roadblocks to compassion in a virtual world, because that's sort of what we're dealing with from, for now and, and from the past two years. Um, physical distance naturally fosters emotional distance. We are not having those same connections with people in the same room that we would be having in person. And we are grateful for these times that we do get in person, but the majority of our interactions right now are virtual. And while we might get better at them, and it is easier to have better connections through a virtual world now than it would have been a couple years ago, um, there is still something that lacks in your want and need to be close with other people um, when we are in a virtual system. I've got to look out for myself mentality. I think a lot of us have experienced this at some point over the past couple years of no one's going to look out for me but me and I got to worry about myself, which is useful in a lot of ways but does provide a little bit of a roadblock when we want to get down to that vulnerability and empathy. I'm exhausted from feeling so much. This is something that I personally ran into very hard over the past couple years, especially the beginning of 2020. I remember feeling that emotional compassion burnout for months. I was just so tired of feeling so many things all the time um, that it was hard for me to make room for feeling any other way. And that is called that compassion fatigue. I don't feel understood right now, so why should I have to understand anyone else? And this is a big one that I see actually a lot of the time from my clients. Um, they don't feel like they're being understood or listened to, and they don't feel like they need to understand or listen to anyone else. And that's when we're gonna start to talk about, and later on we're gonna touch a little bit on um, starting from the top when it comes to setting a compassionate expectation in the workplace. Um, but these are all incredibly valid things to be feeling, um, especially in the world as it is today. And this is where compassionate leadership will come in. So show of hands, who here sometimes struggles with finding compassion today in the world? Yeah, I know, right? So with the big things, politics, health, the environment, business, and also the little stuff, somebody got in a fender bender with my car, somebody missed a meeting. Um, it all compiles, uh, and it's natural to feel less compassionate when the world is less and less of a gentle space, right? It's, it's getting harder and harder to be a compassionate person. Um, and that's where this practice comes in. But when I talk to people about the issues that they have with using compassion in a workplace, using compassion in a professional environment, I heard a lot of this. So if I show compassion, people will assume I'm weak. The world is a tough place and I need to exude toughness to succeed. People take advantage of others who are empathetic or compassionate. People will assume I have a hidden agenda. People don't do anything that doesn't directly serve them. I can't have critical judgment skills while also being compassionate and empathetic. These are really, really common sort of concerns that I have heard talking to people about. I mean, it's different a little bit when you're at home, you're compassionate with your significant other, you're compassionate with your kids, but a lot of these still apply. They don't, you don't want your kids to take advantage of you if you show them a little too much you know, compassion or whatever it may be. Um, but these are really common fears that we see with compassion and empathy in conversation. 
Um, and there is a lot to be said about them, but there is a lot that doesn't hold up. Um, Nothing in a conversation about compassion suggests weakness, especially when you combine it with wisdom. It's related directly to strength and courage. Uh, and I, I say that because who here can think of a person that exemplifies compassion or a compassionate leader? Does anybody have an example of someone just shout it out? Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. Anyone else, a compassionate leader? Obama, who? Bob Ross. Bob Ross, maybe, a compassionate leader. I hear a lot of Martin Luther King Jr. I hear a lot of Gandhi. I hear a lot of the Dalai Lama. I hear a lot of Mother Teresa. These are all people who are compassionate leaders. And say what you will about them, I don't think that any of them can be considered, you know, uh, some, a pushover, right? A really strong, really influential people who exemplified compassion, and none of us are Martin Luther King or Mother Teresa, but I think that it shows that you can be compassionate and you can have these feelings of empathy and, and gentle conversation without being a pushover, without being weak. The world being tough, sure, but it's about changing that stigma of having compassion, right? So it starts with a, a big push towards this kind of conversation. Um, Compassion also promotes expansiveness and a wider world view. A ton of leaders lead with a compassionate leadership style because it allows them to see situations in a more realistic way. Um, it can bring clarity in the way that if you remove compassion from a conversation, from your analysis of a situation, if you say, well, I'm not gonna get, let feelings get in the way and I'm gonna just look at the facts, you're eliminating an entire half of that conversation that is very much human. Um, I hear it a lot that I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna let emotions get in the way, but to remove emotion from it does end up taking a lot out of the actual possible outcomes. We also default to truth as humans, and the default to truth theory um, is by a, the chair of communication studies uh, at the University of Alabama, Timothy R. Levine, and the basic idea of the default to truth theory is that when we communicate with other people, at our core, we not only tend to believe them, but the idea to not believe them doesn't immediately cross our minds. Um, if we strayed away from that, it's because probably we've been hurt, we've been burned, but our natural reaction to people, what I saw with kids, um, it. I mean, they default to truth all the time. I could tell a kid I was 55, and they'd be like, wow, really? <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> but they'll, they'll believe you. And I mean, not to use that to lie or be not, you know, untruthful in a conversation, but knowing that if you want to be vulnerable and open and compassionate, people tend to not automatically think you're lying. Um, People shouldn't assume you have bad intentions, especially when you prove that compassion time and time again. It is a marathon, um, not a sprint, with compassion, and it does take a lot of practice, as I've said. Um, here I have a quote from the executive chairman of LinkedIn, um, who says, when you understand others from their perspective, it enables you to ask the difficult questions and approach difficult situations um, differently. You'll ask a different set of questions and it enables you to avoid unintended consequences. Carry humility. We are all individuals and when you treat people with that kind of respect, it is incredibly powerful. And this is an insanely compassionate leadership strategy and, and I think that that level of understanding that he's promoting really does um, mean a lot when you have a compassionate workplace. I mean, in all the studies of LinkedIn from when Jeff Weiner was the CEO, I mean, there are really, really great reviews of how that company is led. So if we're gonna talk about tools from, for compassion, again, at work, at home, or for yourself, um, I have a couple that I always like to share, and they're not the law, but they are guidelines that I use to remind myself to have compassionate conversation. The first one I'm gonna talk about is actually from a book called The Four Agreements. 
Um, the Four Agreements is written by a man named Don Miguel Ruiz, who was informed by ancient Mesoamerican called Toltec uh, wisdom. And this is a code of conduct to quote unquote, set yourself free from uh, self-limiting beliefs. Um, and now I look at this a lot of the way that I look at something like astrology. And before you roll your eyes and you're like, oh my God, this girl's gonna start talking to me about astrology. That is exactly something a Capricorn would say. Um, just kidding. <laughs> uh, I use it as a set of checkpoints or communication. So here you can see the four, be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions and always do your best. And I use these, I am not exaggerating, every single day. Um, so while it's up to you how to interpret this, I'm gonna choose to ex explain how I use them. Be impeccable with your word. Uh, this is for me, I remind myself to not have a, have a situation where I'm gonna have to explain like, I didn't mean that, or I said something that I didn't mean, or I didn't mean it in that tone. Being super, super conscious of the way that I talk to people. And that's always step one, because you wanna eliminate any chance of you causing closed offness or hesitance in conversation. The rest of the three are the ones that made the absolute most impact on me, sort of all used in conjunction. Don't take anything personally and don't make assumptions are huge for communicating. Um, you never know what is going on behind closed doors. And at the end of the day, while you can say that doesn't affect me or that doesn't matter, it does. I mean, so many of us are working from home. You don't know who has to go pick their kids up from school. You don't know who is taking care of a family member. You don't know who is you know, working super extra long hours because they're late on rent. It's important to remember that you can't take anything in that moment personally or make assumptions about why someone is saying the thing that they are. Um, the most, I guess, we'll say the most impactful thing that anyone has ever said to me is, it sounds really coarse, but give me a second, is that you don't matter. And I don't mean that in a way of like, you don't matter in the grand scheme of things, obviously you matter. But when you're having a conversation with somebody they're not saying anything to hurt you. They're not thinking of you in any kind of way. You don't matter to them in that moment. You, you are part of the conversation. They're not trying to offend you. They're not trying to make your life harder. Um, and always do your best is always a good checkpoint, right? Did I handle that situation the best way I could have? Is there any reflection I can do about it? And if you combine all three of these things, um, you can go into conversations thinking, whatever happens, as long as I do my best, and I am kind, I've done what I can. So following those four pillars that I kind of use going into conversations, I have my own four actionable steps for compassionate conversation. And I, again, use these every day. And I think my, my coworkers can sort of anticipate how I'm gonna explain this because I am incredibly appreciative and it makes compassionate conversations a thousand times easier. Um, we start with that listen pillar. So I'm gonna, it's gonna zoom away and then zoom back, don't worry. Um, the listen pillar, I always say to practice, practice active listening and observation in your conversations. Really listen and hear and look if you have the opportunity to, to what people are saying and how they're acting. I was watching a little you know, animated short on compassion earlier. And the woman was having a conversation with a friend and he said, you know, I go into my grocery store every day and I see the same checkout girl every day and I have never noticed anything about her. And they made it an active you know, experience to go in there and notice that person that they talk to every day, really listen to what they're doing. You have a predetermined notion about people sometimes until you really observe them. They said they always thought in the back of their minds that this checkout counter person at the grocery store was always had a little bit of a, of a scowl on and wasn't a very happy person. And when they took the time to go in and really notice, um, they noticed she was you know, singing to herself before someone came up to the counter and she did have a smile on. And the more that you take time to actively recognize people, um, the easier those compassionate conversations are gonna be. 
Another important thing that someone told me once was that it is not you versus another person. It is you and another person versus a problem or a hurdle or something that you are acting to, you know, alleviate. It's not you versus another person. It's you and them together versus a problem. I use this in, in any kind of conversations I have, even at home, even, you know, with my significant other. It's never me versus you. And again, that breaks down that first barrier of the conversation of why you're talking to them. The second pillar is to appreciate. And this one for me has been absolutely life-changing. Um, this past year, I have made it a point to start verbally appreciating the people around me in my workplace, at home. And you would not believe the reaction that it gets. So recently at work, I had an experience where Again, I'm an account manager. One of my clients had a problem with a product and their project manager called me in the middle of the day and was like, oh my gosh, this thing broke. I had no idea how it happened. I am so sorry. Like, I will do anything I can to help fix it. And, you know, I'm listening to her and, and I know the steps that it takes to fix something like this. And before any of the rest of the conversation happened, I said, listen, Thank you so much for reaching out to me and doing what you can. I really appreciate the work that you have done on this problem. I know that it's not super easy to fix on the fly. I know you're probably under a ton of pressure. And I just want you to know I appreciate the work that, that you're doing. And she took pause. She stopped. And she was like, thank you so much for saying that. It gets hard sometimes when people don't know what you do when people don't understand or appreciate the work that you put in. And all the appreciation that I give is, is completely genuine. I never make it up. I'm never like, oh, I'm going to say I appreciate this person just to get through this conversation. Um, you can always find something to appreciate about a person and what they do. And I think that if you sprinkle a little bit of appreciation into almost every conversation that you have, especially ones that you feel like are hard or difficult, because it's not easy for other people either, you will be shocked to see how people open up and are more willing to work with you because they feel appreciated and they're going to appreciate you back. It's just, they, it's, it opens a door. So appreciation is, is, in my opinion, the most important step in this process. Then going on to reflection. So you can reflect on the conversation, problem, or hurdle. You can do it yourself alone. You can do it through conversation with that person. But this point, of reflection is what changes it from empathy to compassion. Remember, empathy is that feeling of, of suffering for another person. Compassion has the action attached to it. So when you reflect and act on a conversation, a compassionate conversation that you've had, an empathetic conversation you've had, you are gonna be able to attack that situation with a new lens and a completely different set of tools to go forward. Um, you will be able to act in a way that will better reflect the situation at hand. Um, and so those are my four sort of main pillars of compassionate conversation when I'm working, again, at home. But if compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. And this is where you're going to be able to really change the way that you feel compassion, is that you have to change it by starting with yourself. Self-compassion, the self-compassion method came out of Harvard from two, um, I believe, psychologists, Chris Germer and Kristen Neff. And self-compassion is quoted as involving the capacity to comfort and soothe ourselves, to motivate ourselves with encouragement when we suffer, fail, or feel inadequate. Self-compassion is learned in part by connecting with our innate compassion for others, and self-compassion also helps us grow and sustain our compassion for other people. If you do not allow yourself that same kind of compassion that you would like to allow other people, you won't be able to do it effectively. Something I also found very interesting about this theory of self-compassion is they talk about something called backdraft. If you are not in the practice of showing yourself compassion, if you want to start you might experience something called backdraft, which is actually a firefighting term when you open a door of a burning house and fire shoots out at you. Um, you have to get past that first hurdle of feeling 
icky and gross about the compassion that you're showing yourself. You have to get over the idea that it is um, selfish or self-indulgent. And once you get past that hurdle, you have those kind of conversations with yourself before you have them with anything else. Um, it'll become a million times easier. So I have a little slide next that is compassion and practice. And you can do this alone, or you could do it with your table. But your activity for here and for now is to think of a time when you wish someone in your life would have shown you more compassion, either in your personal life or professional life. And I want you to use those four steps that I talked about, listening, uh, appreciating, reflecting, and acting. Um, and I want you to allow yourself the compassion you needed at that time. And again, this can be solely by yourself. You can talk about it with people at your table. It's going to give you a minute or two to think through a time that you really could have used a little bit of compassionate conversation or a little bit of compassionate action. And the person wasn't equipped to give it to you at that time. And then I want you to allow it for yourself. Appreciate yourself. Reflect on the situation. And remember the steps that you took to overcome the hardship. And once you think about that for a minute, I do want you to think about a time that you could have had more compassion for someone else. Um, I think we've all been a little bit high strung at points or a little bit less concerned with other people and just reflect on a time of, hey, I could have had a little bit more compassion. I could have listened a little harder. I could have appreciated that person. So I'm gonna give you guys just a minute to do that. As you're thinking about this, um, I'm going to talk about a couple ways that we can practice self-compassion in this way and avoid empathy burnout and compassion fatigue. So to allow yourself this kind of compassion, you're going to block out time for yourself. It always starts with you. Um, I never did this before. I have been sort of on a work hustle for the past couple years and was really losing myself to it for a while. And I would work from you know eight to six and then I would make dinner and watch Selling Sunset and go to bed and <laughs> that was all I did in a day. And I've started blocking out time for myself in the afternoon either to you know, eat lunch and step away from my computer or to reflect on my day at the end of the day. And it has made an entire difference in how I approach my days. It splits it up. It doesn't feel so overwhelming. You need to remember your emotional boundaries. And this is huge for not feeling that compassion and empathy burnout. If you feel like you're getting to a point where you are not being productive with your empathy and you are getting overwhelmed and you're taking on too much, take a step back, communicate that hey, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed right now. Give me an hour or so, I'll get back to you. Uh, give me a day to reset my brain and we'll talk about this again. Taking your time and your emotional boundaries seriously and communicating them with other people sets a precedent for all of the communication that you have. Cultivate friendships. Um, I go into every conversation that I ever have as though this person's been my friend for five years, right? I immediately, no boundaries, uh, not no boundaries, but no, no wall, no boundaries, <laughs> no walls are up, um, no sort of nervousness. And that cultivation of friendships makes every single conversation I have worth it. Um, I think that it also helps people not feel so nervous to talk to, to someone. I can be loud and I can be boisterous, but if the loud and boisterous person is your friend, then it's a little, it's a little bit easier to talk to them. Um, and those friendships, while they might be not supernatural at first, will become natural with time. You, you know, water them and grow them into whatever kind of friendship or relationship you, you need. Um, and those friendships will carry you through and help you avoid that empathy burnout and compassion fatigue by being genuine and sharing these emotions equally. Having that time for self-reflection. I know that a lot of research and studies that I've talked to about, or I've, I've read about um, emotional burnout, you know, compassion, empathy, a lot of it has to do with meditation, reflection, prayer, whatever you use. Um, I'm not the best myself at setting time for meditation or, or 
thoughtfulness in that way, but I do it in other ways, right? I set aside time to take a walk. And during that walk, I might not listen to any music. And I just reflect on my day. And I reflect on conversations that I could have had or that I did have that went wrong or that went right. It doesn't have to be so serious. It doesn't have to be you download the Headspace app and sit for 30 minutes looking at a wall. It can really be just like take a walk, clear your head, think about your day. Get outside in that same notion. We've been cooped a little bit over the past couple years. Getting out for a walk does that oxygen does clean your brain somehow. It resets you and it, it makes it easier to go back to work or go back to the computer screen. And then we have some for the leaders. Um, Set workplace strategies and lead by example when it comes to compassionate conversation. Um, this is huge. Uh, this can change the way your workplace functions. If you as a leader show compassion, create spaces for open communication. Um, something that I have implemented with my clients is I host a monthly user-led discussion series where my clients can come onto a Zoom call and talk about problems that they're having or find solutions together. Creating those spaces for openness and communication is huge. Um, I oftentimes encourage leaders that I talk to to have um, town halls or office hours even. Um, you set up a Zoom room at 4 p.m. on a Thursday and, you know, have anybody who wants to come in and talk to you about something, give them the chance. And a town hall once a month where people can submit anonymous concerns and you can genuinely listen and hear them out and make plans to fix things that might be bothering people that they might not feel heard about. Those workplace strategies and those open dialogues result in an in incredible increase in productivity and satisfaction in your companies. Um, there are studies from U Michigan that state, in fact, in 2020, 76% of employees believe an empathetic organization inspires more motivated employees compared to 65% who said the same in 2019. The need for empathy and compassion in your workplace is growing. Um, Jane Dutton from U Michigan said that we found that employees who'd experienced compassion at work uh, saw themselves, their coworkers, and the organization in a more positive light. Statistically, they demonstrated more positive emotions, such as joy and contentment, and more commitment towards the organization. So these practices, these open dialogues, these spaces for conversation, and that compassion that you can give your employees, your clients, your friends, your coworkers, results in an overall increase in satisfaction in the workplace. And at the end of the day, I think that's what we would all be going for when running an office or running a workspace. When an organization's capacity for, capacity for compassion comes from the top, it can result in a kind of compassion contagion that sweeps the whole organization. So wrapping up, um, I hope that I have made an appropriate case for finding compassion for yourself during your workday, for your colleagues, for your teams, if you're a leader, again, recommend creating those spaces for open dialogue and communication. I hope you go forward in your conversations by listening, appreciating, reflecting, and acting. And I hope that we can all sort of understand what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding. Thank you very much.